Hello, I'm Haley Arnold, and I'm a PhD student supervised by Professor Anne McGurin and Dr. Amy D. Kahn. And today I'll be sharing a bit about my research on the biodiversity and conservation value of cocoa plantation secondary forests through succession. But before we jump in, I'd really like to thank all the people who have supported me with my work. I'm just so grateful for all you've done to help me in, in developing the methods, in identifying the species, providing access to land, and just general help overall. And I'd like to extend a huge thank you to my brilliant field team as well for sticking with me through it all. Right, now to begin. There are many reasons why forests are valuable. Apart from their aesthetic and recreational value, forests are key ecosystems in many ways. For example, forests store carbon, stabilize the soil, regulate local climate and rainfall patterns, as well as nutrient and water cycling. Importantly, forests also provide habitat for other plants and animals. Forests support much of the world's biodiversity, and what I mean is that even though they only occupy about 7% of Earth's land area, over 50% of all known species can be found within tropical forests alone. But over 29 million hectares of land are deforested every year, which, to give context, is about 57 times the size of Trinidad and Tobago. It's not all doom and gloom, though, since about 7 million hectares of land and regrow with forest annually. These forest gains are mostly from um, plantations and naturally regenerating secondary forests, but with the current patterns of deforestation and regrowth, the area coverage of secondary forest is quickly growing relative to that of primary forest. Recovering young forests, called secondary forests, change dramatically over time as they mature through a process called secondary succession, where species come and go. Changes in species composition happen naturally over succession, or when species are introduced to new locations, species go extinct locally, or when species shift their ranges. But the rate at which species are changing within ecological communities has accelerated across ecosystems globally and this is likely intensified by human activity. It's uncertain how rapid changes in species composition may affect forest processes and the services they provide, including their role as biodiversity reservoirs. And this is important because not all species are ecologically equivalent or perform the same roles. If we take different tree species as an example, there are some that are spreading, some are tall and narrow, some have buttress roots, and others have needles. And traits like these affect how a species interacts with other organisms and with their environment. For example, some trees produce fruit, which is a great food resource for fruit-eating animals. And some have deeply furrowed bark, which can make great homes for insects that can then be prey for something else. So, if we know that there is an ongoing shift in forest cover from primary to secondary forest, and that the species which make up forest communities is changing rapidly, what does this mean for the future of forest conservation? Well, some of the best and most lasting approaches to conservation are those that benefit both people and nature. Cocoa is particularly interesting because research indicates that cocoa plantations can have some of the same structural characteristics as natural forests, and that they can have high levels of biodiversity. So cocoa farming could potentially fit within this kind of human and nature framework. For my research, I'm interested in how the long history of growing cocoa has shaped the ecology of Trinidad's forests. Specifically, I want to know how the diversity and composition of forest communities changes over time after cocoa plantations are abandoned, and how this affects the ability for forests to provide habitat and act as biodiversity reservoirs. To start answering these questions, I surveyed the tree, brown vegetation, bird, and butterfly communities and actively cultivated and abandoned cocoa plantations at different stages of secondary succession. Where here, the age since abandonment, um, the age since a cocoa plantation was abandoned is being used as a proxy for time. And I also surveyed some primary forests. 
You can see the sites are scattered across the Northern Range Mountains, and the Northern Range provides an excellent model for succession because, the long his because of the long history of cocoa farming in Trinidad, where the cycles of new cocoa plantation formation and later abandonment throughout the Northern Range have resulted in this mosaic of forest patches at different stages of regeneration. To collect data on the trees, ground vegetation, and epiphytes, which are the plants growing on trees, we conducted five randomly placed 50 meter transects. So for this, we would find a random point, and then a random direction, and that became our transect. At the start of each transect, we took environmental data, including the slope, canopy cover, weather, and visibility, as well as some GPS coordinates. Then we conducted two ground plant surveys at five meters on either side of the start and end of the transect line. And we identified all the tree species within five meters on either side of the transect, measured their trunk diameter, and estimated their height and growth form. And we surveyed the epiphytes on each tree trunk at chest height as well. We then surveyed the butterflies on the way back where we noted the species, distance, and direction of each individual butterfly as we walked past. Lastly, we conducted separate bird surveys that were at near dawn. The bird transects spanned the entire length of each site and were centered so that they were at least 50 meters from the forest edge. Again, we recorded the species, distance, and direction of each individual bird we could see or hear while walking along the transect line as well as a bit about, of information about their behavior. And again, I really can't thank my field team enough. They stuck with me and kept working through terrible weather, tough terrain, and frequent river crossings so that we always had soggy feet. Getting stuck by iphony spines and bitten by mosquitoes. We had really long days with sometimes miles and miles of walking. And Dan somehow managed to get plant samples even when it seemed impossible. So they really did everything they could to help me, and they did it all without a single word of complaint. And I owe them all the more because they were so fun to work with and always made sure we had a great time on field work as well. We got to see some really stunning forests, waterfalls, and landscapes. And largely thanks to Dan, I now know how to get by in the bush, like what to eat, how to make leaf cups, where to find shelter, where to wash up, natural sources of war paint, and even how to brush your teeth on the go. And then of course, we found lots of cool wildlife. Nicholas Manchuk, along with being an invaluable member of the team in general, managed to get some really incredible photos of wildlife that we came across too and some of these are his photos. Overall, I learned so much during my time in Trinidad and had so many amazing adventures and unforgettable experiences. But detours about my fieldwork aside, let's get into some of the results from the data we collected. To look at the first point, how diversity and composition of forests is changing over succession, we will go through some of the diversity metrics we used and some of the results to give you an idea of the patterns that we found. The first aspect of biodiversity that we looked at was species richness. Species richness is simply the measure of how, of how many species are in a given biotic community, so the number of species. If we take this as an example, where the blue, blue and green circles are two different communities and the different colored butterflies are different species, then the blue community is much more species rich than the green community. Now, applying this to the data, there was a significant increase in tree species richness. Here you can see species richness increases vertically while forest age increases horizontally there was no significant change in species richness over time for the other taxa though, which suggests that the active plantations and young secondary forests were able to sustain species rich bird and butterfly communities. And that's great. Secondly, I looked at how much 
species composition changed over time. Again, if the different colors of butterfly represent different species, the identity of the species which make up the red and blue communities are entirely different. So again, applying this to data, there was a significant change in tree and bird composition over forest succession. These plots show how much the community has changed between each successive time point relative to the first time point, which are the active sites. And higher values along the vertical axis indicates a bigger change in species composition. So this shows that species composition becomes more and more different from the active plantations as the forest matures. And you can see the forest community continues to change and remains compositionally different from primary forest even after 100 years of succession. So the oldest um, abandoned plantation forest that we found still had different tree and bird composition from primary forest, even though they had been abandoned for over 100 years. Next, I wanted to look at how the species composition was changing. Here we have bubble plots, where forest age increases along the bottom, and the size of the dot indicates the relative abundance of a given species. I've taken some tree and bird species as examples. So you can see um, we get three main patterns. First, species which are more common in older forests such as yellow mang, wild nutmeg, red-eyed vireos, and white-bearded mannequins. Secondly, secondly, there are species which are about equally distributed among all the different forest types, such as mountain immortel and cocoa trees. And since cocoa trees can live over 100 years, it's not surprising that they're still found in the old abandoned sites. Um, as well as white neck jacobin, hummingbirds, and banana quits. Lastly, there are species which are more common in active plantations in young secondary forests, and these include um, orange and avocado, as well as other agricultural trees, and palm tanagers and kiskadees. Typically, the species which are more common in active and young forests are generalist species, which are very common um, utilize a wide range of resources and can thrive in many different types of habitats. And in the case of trees, those in active and recently abandoned sites are unsurprisingly usually agricultural trees which were intentionally planted there. Species which are more common in older forests, though, are typically the rarer and more sensitive species. Continuing on from this, and taking birds as an example, we looked at the proportion of species categorized as low, medium, and high forest dependent with forest age. You can see that on the far left, the proportion of highly forest dependent species, bird species, including the long-billed gnat run, toucans, red-eyed vireos, bellbirds, collared trogons, and black-faced ant thrushes, um, and similar birds, they all increase significantly with forest age. The proportion of medium and low forest dependent species, however, didn't change very much over time. So to summarize, there was overall little change in species richness with forest age, except for in the trees, but species composition did change substantially over succession. Now to finish, how do the results fit into the bigger picture and what does this mean for forest conservation? Results from my research and from that of others highlight that primary forests are biodiverse and that it can take centuries for a secondary forest to recover old growth conditions if they ever do. Primary forests have traditionally been the focus of conservation initiatives, and I agree they should be protected. But the research also suggests that active plantations and secondary forests do contribute to conservation and the maintenance of biodiversity as well. And as the proportion of secondary forest and plantation forest continues to grow, they will become increasingly important biodiversity reservoirs. And because the species composition of secondary forests at different successional stages is unique, 
The patchwork mosaic of different forest types in the northern range can contribute to the wider landscape level of biodiversity. So then, what does this mean for Trinidad, and especially for Trinidadian landowners? Well, traditionally grown cocoa um, is, is grown in mixed plantations with other fruit trees like citrus, mango, and avocado, as well as some shade trees. But there's an ongoing shift where more and more farmers are starting to grow cocoa in what's called sun plantations, which is essentially just a plot of cocoa with nothing else mixed in. Unlike many other forms of agriculture, traditional cocoa has standing trees which form two canopy layers, a shade layer and the cocoa understory, which provides this three-dimensional, complex three-dimensional structure that other plants and animals can use as habitat. The traditional plantations also have an abundant and diverse array of flowers which produce nectar and fruits, both of which can help support wildlife. So, the traditional growing methods go a long way towards conserving local biodiversity compared to some plantations. As for the human perspective, there's growing interest in ethically and sustainably produced products, and local artisan companies in Trinidad, such as Brasa Seco, Ortinola, Arc, Omar Bean, Cocoa Republic, and others, are working to meet these rising demands, and in doing so, contribute to preserving biodiversity in Trinidad as well. While sustainably managed cocoa plantations may not have as high yields as intensive cocoa farming at first, and the cocoa trees may take longer to mature and reach peak, pr peak production, the trees in traditional plantations typically produce cocoa for longer, and they may be more resilient to pests and diseases as well. Also, having a mix of crop trees means that, if the cocoa ever does become infected for whatever reason, there, the farmer will have other fruit trees which can still provide them with an income. So traditional cocoa fits within a human and nature framework by providing sustainable income for locals while also protecting the environment. As for secondary forests, they often get a bad reputation of being damaged or degraded, but the research shows that they can be really valuable ecosystems. If you do happen to have secondary forests on your property then, you can rest assured that by doing absolutely nothing and just letting nature take its course, you're helping to sustain local biodiversity and so contributing to forest conservation. By continuing to farm cocoa the traditional way and valuing our secondary forests, we can contribute to biodiversity conservation in, Tri in Trinidad. And importantly, now we have another reason to eat ethically sourced chocolate guilt-free. Thank you.